Thank you very much, Jordan, for that fine introduction. Uh, as he said, my name is Ed Modler from the Options Industry Council. We're the ones who put those slick backpacks on each uh, chair and gave you some goodies there. So hopefully you'll enjoy that and we're on your good side right away. I want to gauge the audience uh, before we begin. How many of you are familiar with options contracts, how they work, basic terms and definitions? Not too many hands went up. Everybody in the room will know what an options contract is by the time I'm done. We're going to get to an educational piece towards the end. Uh, but first I want to start with the industry, my experience, what brought me through the industry, and some things that I've learned along the way. I don't consider these necessarily to be pieces of advice because you may disagree with some things that I say. But for me personally, a lot of the experiences I've had have been eye-opening, and I've taken those lessons and, and held on to them throughout my career. First, I have to put this slide up. Legal and compliance makes me do it. Options aren't for everybody. They're unique and complex, so you have to make sure you know what you're doing before you get in. That's all I have to say about the disclaimer. Back in 1997, I was a senior in college, like some of you are, uh, at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, about to graduate with my degree in finance. Didn't know what I wanted to do. And so utilizing contacts and people that I knew, a friend of a friend's brother worked for one of the largest options market-making firms on the CBOE and the Chicago Mercantile or CME exchange and I used that contact to get an interview. His name was Frank, and he was one of their uh, top traders. Uh, I was very interested in this business, had talked to my professors and my colleagues, and they said, it's a great business, it's exciting, you really should look into it and consider it. So I was all for it, and went to interview at this firm. It was grueling, two or three interviews, several of them were all day long, and odd questions. This was the trading world, very mathematical. I was getting questions like, what's the square footage of Arizona? Tell me right now. Of course, they didn't want to know what it was. They wanted to know how you thought on your feet when you got thrown a curveball. And they were looking for an answer like, well, maybe it takes six hours to drive across, 50 miles an hour, 300 miles across. Arizona's a, a, probably a box. So 300 by 300, 300 squared is 90,000 square miles. There's my answer. That may or may not be right, but that's what they were looking for. How do you think on your feet when something comes at you that's a little bit off? Uh, so I did those interviews and enjoyed them. And Frank called me up. I remember in my uh, apartment, senior year on campus, he called me and said, Ed, you did great. The guys loved you. We think you're going to be a great a member of our team, and we'd like to extend you an offer. And I pretty much cut him off right there, and I said, I accept, right away. And he said, no, you don't, Ed. You don't accept that fast. I haven't even given you details. I haven't told you what we're going to pay you. I said, you're right, Frank. I'm a little excited. I don't accept yet, what are the details? And so he gave me those details, and two minutes later I said, okay, great, now I accept. <laughs> and he said, I'll, I'll, I'll take that, that's your verbal commitment. Uh, we'll get you out something in writing, and we'll get you on board. So I went right to the trading floor, uh, right into the pits. And this environment um, is completely different than any other work environment you'll ever step into. It is the epitome of organized chaos, which probably doesn't even strengthen the environment enough. It's more like unbelievably organized, incredibly efficient, and overwhelmingly chaotic. That's what it was. You walk down there and it's very loud. People are shouting, people are hand signaling. Most people have earplugs, that's how loud it is. There's papers flying around, everybody's speed walking, and faces are stone-faced. You can feel the intensity in people's voices as they're shouting from the brokers to the traders asking for markets. Am I filled? What's the status? You can feel how passionate people are because their clients are on the phone demanding answers. Very intense. I met all the traders that I was going to work for in the options pit. That's where I was going to be, the options on the S&P futures. I also met our guy in the S&P futures pit, which was the largest on the floor. This pit was circular with about 10 stairs up. It looked like a dome. And the firm that I was working for was, was very large, so our guy was right in the center, in the bottom of this dome. And they said, Ed, you need to go in there and introduce yourself to this guy. I didn't know why my chaperone didn't go with me, but I found out in a second. It's very difficult to weave your way through this pit because it's so tight. You get down in the center of it, and this guy's name was Peter, and I said, Peter, nice to meet you, I'm new on board. Now all of a sudden I thought, is there a hole in the ceiling or something? Is it raining in here? Is it drizzling? No, no, so much shouting is going on. Dry spit 
particles are flying everywhere and raining down on your head. That's the kind of environment this is. I said, hi, I'm out of here, goodbye. I didn't work for this guy, so I never went in that pit ever again. But that's the kind of environment the trading floor was. Very intense. Paramedics were on site just in case there was a medical emergency. That was something the exchange had. And I saw that once. And it was a bit eye-opening. This was some guy I didn't know in a pit down the floor somewhere, collapsed, heart attack, stroke, who knows. Paramedics run in, grab the guy, put him on a stretcher, take him out. Now, what was revealing to me, and this guy was wheeled out right in front of me, was nobody batted an eye. Nobody even looked at what was going on. Everybody is still trading and hand signaling, and papers are going back and forth, as this guy could be dying for all we know. We have no idea. But then here I am, still an, brand new out of college, they realized the market doesn't stop for that. These brokers are handling orders from banks and institutions and hedge funds who aren't going to care that some guy had a heart attack. They want to know what's the status of their order. And that broker needs to take care of their clients, so they did. That was eye-opening, that was revealing. My job down on the floor was to communicate. That's what I was down there to do. I was working for guys who traded options on S&P futures at the Merck. We had another team that was trading options on the S&P cash index at the CBOE. My guys needed to know exactly what was going on in that other pit and vice versa. So I went down with a headset and had to listen to what was going on in the other pit. My first day on the job, I put the headset on. I told the guy training me, it doesn't work. It's off. It's broken. He started laughing. He said, no, it's not. You have to have a trained ear for this. It was on. I just couldn't hear a damn word. It was so loud down there. Eventually, a few days later, after I got my earplug in, I started to hear what was coming across the headset. After a few more days, I started to actually understand the words. Now, you're communicating a lot of details back and forth. So you also have to work on your short-term memory. I might be saying something to my guys like, hey, at CBOE, uh, the December 2000, 1800 put spread one by two traded at 12 and a half. Goldman Sachs bought, local sold, 1,000 traded, they're working another 1,000, 30 cents over theoretical value. And it, those kind of details I have to hear at once and communicate either verbally or through hand signal to my guys. After a few months, I started to get really good at this and very confident in what I was doing. They started to leave me by myself. This guy's got it. He's solid. So I got a bit of a swagger for a little while. One time I was communicating a trade into my guys and I gave them all those details, all 10 of them, and I had gotten one backwards, didn't realize it then. Communicated him this information, a few seconds later he turns around at me and he says, I'm checking, are you sure about what you just told me? That should have tipped me off. Maybe I screwed something up. I was a little bit too confident and I said, yep, that's right, you got it. He takes that information, makes a trade, turns out to be a bad trade, he spent about $15,000 on a trade that was terrible and was gonna lose money, and he was livid. He came running out of the pit, charging at me. I still don't know what's going on. It looks like he's gonna strangle me or punch me. He gets right up to me, but before he can grab me, he finds the first thing he can find, which is a phone, picks the phone up off the receiver, and just starts bashing the heck out of it until it smashes, and he breaks it, he cools down, and then he gives me a verbal lashing for giving him bad information. And he said, Ed, I need to know information right away. I need to get it first. But more than that, I need to have it correct. You have to have it correct. You can't think you're right, you have to know you're right. And in the business of trading, you cannot make mistakes. If you have to double check something, do it. Triple check, do it. But everything you tell me has to be correct or else we lose money. I got put in my place right there and I learned that lesson the hard way. I still behave that way. I had to when I was a trader, but now that I'm more in the corporate world, I still communicate when I know I'm right or, or incredibly confident that I have the right response or answer. I may offer opinions and insight a few fewer times than my colleagues when we're in meetings or conference calls, but people really do listen to me because they know if this guy says something, he really thinks it's right. He really believes it. And I think that's been valuable to me throughout my career. So six months or so into uh, my life on the trading floor, Frank, my mentor, gives me my first review. And of course, it's what you'd expect. You're doing great, but you have some flaws. We think you're gonna be great at this, but you have some things to work on. That's what you'd expect to hear. But ultimately, he says, Ed, I really think you are cut out for this business. I think you're gonna be good at it. You don't know it yet, but you'll know at some point. 
You'll know because you won't think of trading as a job anymore. You won't think of it even as a career. It'll be a lifestyle for you. It will become who you are. You will eat, sleep, and drink the business. Wake up in the morning in the shower, think about trading. Having breakfast, checking the market. Work from bell to bell. Go out for a beer happy hour with your buddies, talking about trading. At dinner, thinking about trading. Whatever you do in your late night hours in your personal life, you'll be thinking of trading maybe a little bit. But it'll take you over. And it hadn't at that point, so I had to take a step back and think, do I really want that? Do I really want to be taken over? I didn't have a choice. A little bit longer in this business, and it did. It completely consumed me, and it became a lifestyle, and I loved it. Now, this might not be for everybody, but you can allow your role to define you and still accomplish a work-life balance. But this, I think, is ideal. Did Steve Jobs have a career? Or does Elon Musk have a career? No, they are what they do. They are defined by what they do. And I think that's great. I think everyone should strive to achieve that and at least be open to that possibility. So my trading floor career lasted shorter than I wanted it to. The trading floor became obsolete after about five years down there for several reasons. Um, we used to trade in, in fractions, making markets an eighth and a quarter, or three eighths and seven eighths, and that went to decimals, which greatly tightened the bid-ask spreads on the options markets. Um, before the turn of the century, if you wanted to trade an options on a particular symbol, you had to send it to one exchange. Now you can send it to all of them. Uh, that increased competition for professionals like myself. And then, of course, electronic trading took over, and the floors became more and more obsolete. There were two different market-making firms that I worked for, and both of them were making money hand over fist throughout most of the 80s, the entire decade of the 90s. And when this evolution of the business started to occur, they started to struggle. And us guys that were on the floor in the pits could see that coming. We knew the obstacles that were popping up that had never been there before. And we tried to communicate this to the partners and the senior executives, but they really weren't having it. I've seen this several times throughout my career. When an owner of a business or a manager of a business has been successful for so long, making money, they become stubborn in their business model. They think this works without exception. And when it stops working, they point fingers elsewhere. And we were getting fingers pointed at us. You guys need to work harder. You guys need to work smarter. We were trying to wave our hands saying, no, we need to change our approach. The approach doesn't work anymore. We need to be more analytical. We need to use fundamentals and technicals and analyze volatility instead of the tra trading the way we were. But the partners would not do it. They would not change. So by seeing several failures, I got to learn that you have to evolve as the situation around you changes. That's constantly going to happen. The world is constantly changing, and so is business. So were your lives and your career, and you have to be willing and open your eyes to accept that change. It's harder to drive change. I tried to do it, but your bosses may not be open for it. Your bosses may be stubborn. Sometimes you may have to make a decision. Is this where I need to be? I had to make that decision once. I see this business failing. It's not changing. The bosses are stubborn. They're stuck in their business model. I think I need to move on. I did that once. A few other times, I didn't, and I got stuck in a, fail a failed business. For Several years in the 2000s decade, I was mentoring day traders in various offices. Uh, I wasn't a full-time day trader myself. Um, I was trading stocks, trading options, and somewhat day trading futures occasionally, but I was mentoring uh, day traders. And I used an analogy that might be a little silly, but I would say, say to them, they need to act like a psychiatrist during the trading day. And here's what I mean by that. As a day trader, you need to walk in and believe that you're a psychiatrist and the market is your patient who is schizophrenic. Your job is to identify the personality that you're dealing with right now and then decide how you need to react to best handle that personality. If you can do those two things, you've got a pretty good chance to be successful. But don't close your eyes, don't blink because that personality can change 10 times in a day, or it might not change at all, you need to constantly be evaluating. If it changes, you need to recognize that. 
When it changes, you then have to change your behavior. How do I now respond to this new situation that I'm dealing with or being confronted with? And that's what I mean by being a psychiatrist. Day traders have to do that. But I think this could apply across just about any business and to some extent to personal lives. Evaluate your circumstances. They will change. And this helps you realize if you're constantly evaluating and constantly determining how I need to behave, you're going to make mistakes. You're not going to be 100%. But this approach drives home the concept of evaluating what's around you and change when needed. Now, eventually, I knew I'd get into the service side of the business. And I made that happen um, right around the 2010-11 area after a number of years trading. I shifted from being a full-time trader to a part-time trader and got into the service side. I always wanted to work with clients, went out, got my Series 3 license, wanted to be a futures broker, looked up who's the biggest and best and baddest company in the business and hounded their sales manager and office manager. Called him every other day for three weeks. He asked me to send my resume to him at least five times. Every time I said, yes, sir, I'll have it on its way. Called him back two days later. Did you get a chance to take a look at my resume? Well, this was a sales job. He liked that. He wanted that. This guy doesn't give up. When I send this guy a prospect, he's going to hound him until he becomes a client. He wanted that. So I got brought in for an interview. He finally said, Ed, come on in. We'll talk to you. Gave me a job offer, and I was thrilled. This company's name was MF Global. How many are familiar with MF Global? Nobody. I went to work for them in the summer of 2011. By October, this was the seventh largest bankruptcy in the history of this country. Four months into the job. Here's how that unwound. Went to work in this office. I got shown the ropes. I already had my license. I didn't need much more training on that. Got on the phones right away. Started calling clients. Started calling prospects. Started building my business. Feeling great about what's going on. Working in a room full of brokers. Everyone's making tons of money. Feeling like I'm going to be here for the rest of my career. This is exactly where I want to be. In October of 2011, about four months into the job, MF Global releases their third quarter earnings report and exposes to the world all of the investments they've made into European sovereign debt. They were investing in countries like Italy and Spain and Belgium. At a time when those countries were offering very solid interest rates in return, that's why John Corzine, the CEO of the company, made those investments. However, there was a lot of uncertainty surrounding the financial condition of those countries. So when this exposure was broadcast to the investing public, it wasn't handled well. Our credit rating was declined, and it caused a lot of chaos. When your credit rating gets declined and you're an investment bank, that's a problem. So it wasn't going well. Office got a little jittery, but our executives and our top brass managers were calming us down. They were telling us, everything's going to be fine. We're going to battle through this. I was showing up to work every day talking to my clients. A few weeks later, I show up in the morning like any other day, and one particular client, one of my more wealthy more established clients, an active trader. I talked to him in the morning and in the afternoon every single day. He called me in the morning. He knew what was going on in the office. And he said at the end of the conversation, I kid you not, Ed, am I going to talk to you this afternoon? Are you going to be there this afternoon? I thought, absolutely. Why wouldn't I be here this afternoon? I'll talk to you after lunch. Give me a call. Hung up the phone. Within 90 minutes, Chicago Board of Trade Security enters our office, dozens of them, they line the walls of the office, and head of security gets out in front and says, okay, everybody, you have 30 minutes. Pack up your personal belongings and vacate the office. Before you leave the door, you have to line up single file because you have to search your bags before you leave. This is how we found out we were losing our jobs, on the spot. And we had 30 minutes to go. I was sitting there like, you've got to be kidding me. I just started this job, everything's going great. Four months in, it's over. There were people there 20, 25 years, and they were thrown this on a dime. You've got to go right now few handshakes to your colleagues that you work with for 20 years, and you have to leave the building. This was a, a necessary evil. Of course, the environment was not so friendly. There was a lot of foul language going around from a lot of people, understandably so. But security had to do this. There was a lot of sensitive information that was contained in that office. Names, contact information, financial uh, situations, account statements. None of those statements could leave the office. So Board of Trade had to do what they had to do. They had to surprise us, shock us, and give us no time to put anything in our bags that we could then take out that was sensitive information. So it had to happen that way. Very unfortunate, but eye-opening. It's jaded me for a little bit. I still feel like I have to expect unexpected things. 
Don't take any situation for granted. Even if you feel like, this is great, this is exactly where I want to be. Something that, that is shocking can happen to you. It's happened to me. Hopefully it won't, but it's possible. So not taking things for granted. Prepare for the worst scenario and expect things that are completely unexpected. Then your colleagues, if you can expect the unexpected. When something crazy happens, your colleagues might be me right now, and what would I do if it did happen? You'll be prepared to jump right up. My position right here, I'm very happy with, it's very good, but what happens if I walk into work tomorrow and they say, Ed, we're closing our doors? That would shock the heck out of me, but you know what? I've thought about that, and I know exactly what I would do. So expect those things to happen and prepare yourself for that. So now I'm in education, in support. I work with trading firms, financial advisors, individual investors, and we teach. So I want to get into what options are. I told you everyone's going to know what an option is by the time I'm done here today. In a world without options, there's really not much you can do. If you're a stock trader, you can buy stock or you can sell stock. The P&L graphs are pretty damn simple. Your break-even point is right where you got in. You make money if it goes one way, you lose if it goes the other. The only other graph I could have put up here is if you held your money in cash and you earned a risk-free interest rate. Again, a flat P&L graph. When you enter the world of options, it's like opening the doors to the chocolate room. You look around and you see so many things you want, but you have to start somewhere. You pick the things that look the most appetizing, and once you've gotten your fill there, you go somewhere else. This is just a sample of what P&L graphs look like for some options trades. You'll see some of these make money when the market is bullish, some when the market is bearish, some when the market is neutral and going nowhere. There are strategies that have unlimited risk and reward potential, some that are confined and controlled. You can do just about anything with options. I've been in the business 21 years. I feel a lot of questions from traders. I still constantly get questions that I've never heard before. I'm still learning. And that's why I love the business. Options offer flexibility. The first part of the equation when you trade is having a market analysis. Whatever that is, technical analysis, fundamental analysis, talking to your neighbor, having a mentor, you define what situation the market is in and then you make a trade. Once you've made that analysis, the options market allows you to trade just about any opinion you have. I am short-term neutral, long-term bearish. I'm short-term bearish, long-term neutral. You can do any analysis you want and find an options trade that fits. That lets you get into more trades. This isn't just for traders. This is for people who are in other businesses who invest their money and take it seriously. I, I speak to plenty of people who are truck drivers and architects and all sorts of businesses who use options to help their portfolios because they can do so much more using options than if they just traded with stocks. So what are they? What are these things that I love? Options are contracts. They're traded on, the ex on an exchange between a buyer and a seller. The buyer pays money up front and now they own the right to execute a stock transaction. The seller of the option is paid money up front and they are taking on the obligation to potentially have to fill the other side of that stock transaction that the buyer has the right to. The details of that stock transaction are defined within the contract itself. The specific price, how long this, rights, this right and obligation exists is written into the contract and an analysis of those details is what determines what the option price will be. The buyer and seller negotiates that and a trade occurs. The key takeaway is that buyers have rights and sellers have obligations. Next logical question, what do you have a right to? How do you know if you're buying or selling? It depends what kind of option you buy. There are two kinds. There are calls and there are puts. If you buy a call option, you're long the option. Don't get the words long and short here confused with market direction. When you're a stock trader and you're long, you're bullish. When you're short, you're bearish. That's not the way those terms are used in the options space. If you're long a contract, you've bought it. If you're short a contract, you've sold it. So this quadrant makes up the entire universe of options trades. There's only four things you can do. You can buy a call option. If you've done so, 
you now own the right to buy 100 shares of stock at a certain price for a certain length of time. If you've bought a put contract, you now own the right to sell shares at a certain price for a certain length of time. This might be a protective strategy. If you own shares of stock and you want to protect it, say you bought it at 60, now it's trading at 80. You don't want to give up the downside, but you want to hold the stock for potential further upside. You can buy a put option, say at a strike price of 70, that gives you the right to sell your shares at 70 if the market tanks. You pay up front for that. Works just like an insurance policy. On the flip side, if you've sold a call option, you are paid up front and you have taken on the obligation to sell your shares at a certain price. You may also want to do that. If you own shares of stock and you want to sell them at a certain price to the upside, you can sell a call option, get paid some money up front, and now obligate yourself to sell shares where you want to sell them. You might be completely comfortable with that, and that's a very popular strategy for investors to use. And the fourth piece is selling a put. Paid up front, under the obligation to buy shares of stock at a certain price. Again, you may welcome that. If the stock's trading at 70 and you want to buy shares at 65 and they're just not going there, you can sell a put option, get paid some money up front, and now be obligated to buy shares at 65. If that doesn't happen, you make the amount of money you sold the put option for. If it does happen and you buy shares, you wanted them anyway. A lot of traders and investors use put options that way. All options spreads can be constructed using these four pieces. This is the universe. You can buy one, sell the other. You can buy two of these, sell one of those, buy one of those. You can buy three of these, sell one of those. Put them all together in any way you want. Different strike prices, different expiration dates. You can start to see how many possibilities there are. There's a lot to learn and a lot to experience. That's why there's so many strategies out there, and it's never ending. You can create your own. So there, in a nutshell, is what options are. I do want to introduce a few key strategies. We have a book in your backpack that has about a dozen different strategies, and here's a few snapshots of those. Here's a few snapshots of those. I'm not going to go through them. I just want to let you know what you're looking at when you go through that book. We've got a P&L graph that shows you where your risk and your reward is. We've got an example of exactly what this trade is and some details behind it. Covered call, very popular. You own stock, and you're selling an option against it, obligating yourself to sell those shares. I mentioned the insurance of the protective put. This means you own shares of stock. You're buying a put to protect it. You can still make money if the stock goes up, but if it crashes, you've got your insurance policy to sell shares at a certain strike price. You paid for that insurance policy up front. There's a bunch of other strategies in that little uh, orange looking quick guide. If you have questions about that, certainly reach out to us and ask. And the last piece here, who are we? The Options Industry Council is an industry cooperative. We work off a budget, we're a nonprofit, we offer education. We fill a gap in the industry to provide free and unbiased education to the investing public. That's what we do, and that's why we exist. Our website is optionseducation.org. Plenty of podcasts, videos, written material is on that website. We do webinars every single month, two or three of them. And you can send us questions at the options at the OCC.com. Here is a list of the OCC. Our funding comes from the Clearing Corporation, or OCC, and support from all of the options exchanges. And I'll leave this slide up in here for a second. The last slide, that's our contact information. Website domain, that's on the back of that booklet that you have. Email options at the OCC.com. I manage the team that responds to those emails. You can send us questions. That's what we're there for. We are there to provide education. So send us those questions by email. I'll make sure we answer those questions within one business day and check out our YouTube channel. Plenty of, of archived webinars that we've done in the past are on our YouTube and we continue to add to that list. So hopefully you've gotten a chance to at least learn a little bit about the industry and everyone understands something about the key terms of options. I hope you found use out of that and uh, I enjoyed speaking to you today. You've got some rock star speakers coming up after me. So enjoy the rest of your day, folks. Thank you very much.